just see how many people are here, I think, just, just said it. Said it all. Uh, as Katrina has pointed out very gently with her very nice introduction, uh, I've been around a long time in this field. Uh, I started uh, in the environment uh, in the U.S. Public Health Service uh, Division of Air Pollution in the 1960s. That was before there was an EPA. Uh, toward the first Earth Day, <coughs> ran an environmental health program, uh, academic program in New Jersey, which uh, in 1980, in the wisdom of the state of New Jersey, realized it had some environmental pro problems and they were able to do something about it. Uh, so I've spoken in front of audiences like this. Uh, I can tell you that in all of these years, I've never seen an issue quite like this one. Uh, it's an issue that is very frustrating. I'm going to contribute to, I think, your frustration. You, you're, you're, you're looking for answers, and I don't have any real answers for you. I hope to help you frame the questions. I hope to help you understand a little better where the uncertainties are. Uh, it's very frustrating for someone like myself. Uh, I thought we progressed in dealing with these kind of issues at a national level so that we would be prepared and be able to do the right thing and know what the problems are before we embarked on doing something. Uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't learned squat. It's really sad, and I particularly I, I see some of my colleagues. Uh, uh, I was fortunate to serve on a, on a, on a committee. We were just talking with Tom Carson, who's the longtime head of the program. I hope that this superb program here, Dr. Rob Joyster, uh, another key uh, faculty member of this excellent program. Uh, it's uh, University of Rochester has always had a very major, and very uh, productive program in environmental health. And yet, as I look back at all these different things we've done, uh, it's really, as I say, disturbing to me to see how little we've progressed in trying to bring this great science that we've developed to bear before we go out and put people at risk. Now, I don't know how big that risk is. I don't know whether they're going to be adverse effects. Uh, I can't tell you that, yes, if you get exposed to this, that this will happen, mainly because we haven't really invest in the resources. My bias to start with is that, besides being an academic health scientist involved in this for many years, uh, my bias is one that basically says, uh, what's the rush? I've done a lot of work recently on the Gulf oil spill. Um, been down there a lot. Uh, dealt with that issue, there's really a major issue as to what extent do we go back into the Gulf and start getting their oil out. And it plays out with some of the issues you hear about, our national needs. Uh, all of these are important issues. In the Gulf, there's a sense of urgency, in part because the Chinese, the Cubans, the Venezuelans are going to get that oil, we need that oil, you ought to get it first. <coughs> but who the hell is going to get the shale gas? The Canadians going to drill underneath. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, so that my my concern and that you'll hear is one. My bias is one of let's do this right. Let's find out what the potential problems are. If we've got 20 years of gas under there, well, gee, the 21st year is we'll need that gas just as much. Now, you're hearing an implicit bias here of mine. Uh, as much as I'd love to see wind and, and, and solar take over for all the different things that uh, we're using fossil fuels for, I, I don't see that happening. I don't see any likelihood that we will not take out all the gas we can reasonably get out of the Marcella shale, Utica shale, whatever we're going to call it. So I start with that belief as my scenario. We're going to get this stuff out. The nation will do it over time. Why do we have to do it right now? So, in a sense, I very much like what the state of New York has done as compared to what my state of Pennsylvania has done. I mean, you've at least delayed a bit before you started. In Pennsylvania, we're just running hell to skelter at, at trying to uh, get this thing going. And a lot of it's being pushed by uh, leases that uh, require you to do something within five years or, or you, lose your, you know, lose your rights to that. So, uh, 
the, the companies want to get in here. They've already invested the money. They don't see why they should wait. Uh, but that's a cap, you know, that's, that's their problem. It's not our problem as a society. Our problem as a society is to try to figure out how to do this right. So with that as an introduction and, and getting at least some of my biases out of the way, let me see if I can figure out how to make this move forward. And I don't see a, 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 a usual clicker. Or, I the tray <laughs> Oh, sorry, the magic, the magic tray. Okay. If, I, if I go like this, here we go. Okay, so how many of you know what a, a, a fracking is? Okay, so just better, so how many don't know, I guess I would say. So I will, no. good, everybody knows what it is, so, so I did these introductory slides are, and, and uh, let me thank uh, uh, for, for, for providing a lot of them. Uh, this is something that I, I'm now the interim director of the Center for Healthy Environments and Communities, which is a center that, that's worked in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania looking at uh, environmental issues in the community for six years now. It's funded by the Heinz and Downs, and, and the goal is to do community-based uh, responsiveness from an academic organization, make that link between the community and, and, and academia. And we, we've just never uh, experienced anything like the Marcella Shale in those six years as well. So it, it's an issue which is just, in many ways, tearing apart communities and has a demand that is uh, much quicker than we can go. So we've got a technique for extracting natural gas from deep below surface. Once you're down there, you can not only uh, get straight down, you can go sideways. Again, I, since you know all this, I won't bother to go through uh, these, these pictures, but basically what you have in detail is, is uh, you've got tanker trucks delivering water, you've got pumper trucks, you've got natural gas coming out of the well, and what, you've got water that's a large part of the process which you have to treat because it's going to be uh, uh, contaminated. You've got storage tanks, you've got compressor tanks, which is even shown here. You've got trucking, you've got pipelines. You got lots of trucking, in fact, in, in all aspects of this. And when you consider risk, you have to consider that as well. Uh, there's lots of shale gas activities going on. It's the folks in Texas who developed uh, uh, this technique, which uh, uh, is uh, much improved over what was expected. Uh, uh, I will tell you that uh, in 1979, I did a number of, uh, of uh, talks on the future of energy and the implications to uh, health on that. And uh, those talks were based upon the uh, assumption at the time that in 30 years we would run out of all fossil fuels except coal. That 30 years was up a couple of years ago. We haven't run out. The reason I tell you this is because I've become very wary of any of these projections of what's going to happen 10, 20, 30 years from now. I'm not sure about that. You get new technology, and that's where suddenly you're bringing this in. We don't know what the next new technology is going to be. Uh, the areas in, in, uh, in New York and Pennsylvania are uh, obvious there. Uh, your areas, uh, uh, the, uh, again, it's an attempt to show that the fact that we've got uh, three different levels of plays, if you will, of potential sources uh, that are in, in most of these areas. That becomes important in the sense of some of the sustainability issues. We're being told that there will be tremendous economic growth in communities. We have, and certainly in the Pennsylvania area, we have uh, uh, rural communities which have not done well in recent years. Uh, they now are uh, seeing the potential for doubling of size, uh, for lots of uh, uh, good things happening in their community to rebound from what's been a, a bad uh, time since the mills left uh, many years ago. Um, but if this is going to run out in 20 years, what happens then? If we think of sustainability, we think of things over time and 20 years from now, You've got a school you built, now you don't have kids anymore for it. You've got roads you built, you've got to take care of them. How are we going to deal with that? Now in Pennsylvania, that's part of the argument about why we need an extraction tax, tax something that our governor seems to be opposed to, but the tax, in, in a sense, provides opportunities to, uh, uh, to shield one for a decline. Certainly that's what's been happening in Alaska. 
Alaska uh, has made lots of money through the years uh, on uh, the oil up there that's going through the pipeline. Uh, that pipeline flow has decreased dramatically in recent years. Uh, but every Alaskan, because some of the money was put into a sinking fund, uh, or whatever they call it, uh, every Alaskan gets about $1,100 a year as a check from the state because that's their share of this oil well from the past. That has helped uh, cushion what would be um, a, a recession in Alaska. Uh, do we need to think that way in terms of what's going to happen after this, uh, these plays run out? Perhaps. Uh, I'm not the one to tell you whether to do it or not, but I will tell you that I have heard no discussion of that. I've only heard discussion of what's going to happen in the next few years, not what's going to happen uh, many years from now and why, uh, if you will, uh, putting away some of the funds might be important for that. Uh, so what's the promise? We've got uh, reduced dependence on foreign fuel, that should say. It's cleaner than coal. We've got existing technology. We've got existing pipelines. So we don't have to build new pipelines as we would if we go to, a, say, a hydrogen economy or something of that nature. Uh, but then what are the problems? Uh, this is, you know, a rural area in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, not exactly uh, what we think of as uh, rural, natural America. What are the stories about upstate New York? And again, I thank uh, colleagues here for doing this. Uh, um, the various uh, economic benefits are, are laid out. Uh, I think you, you, you've heard about them. But communities near drilling have health and environmental concerns. Here's some more pictures. This is uh, Tioga State Forest, which is near the Pennsylvania line. I think it's uh, uh, just north of Williamsport, just below Elmira. Uh, here's a uh, uh, Something from the uh, WW, some from the Shell Shock organization showing pictures of it. Here's some of the, uh, here's a, uh, a tank itself. It's on a double trailer coming down a road. Uh, here's uh, a, a picture of a horizontal hydro factory rig. Uh, uh, so it, you, you have these pictures of things which are sort of a garish in a rural kind of area compared to what we expect and, and, and what we we're used to seeing, but that's, you know, that's, if you will, it's the things that happened. Uh, uh, is that bad? Is that good? Uh, certainly in Pennsylvania, when we look at opinion, we find that whether or not you own your mineral uh, rights uh, seems to have a major impact on whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea. Certainly people who don't own the mineral rights, but the companies have the right to put these kind of uh, things on their property uh, are not all that happy about it. Nor maybe are their neighbors because the, the, the companies will cooperate to the extent of putting it on a property line. Well, you're the next property over. What does that mean to you? And what does it mean to values and way of life? So what are the concerns? There's, there's the truck traffic. Um, there's certainly uh, diesel pollutants coming from the truck traffic. There's accidents. And let's not forget that accidents. Uh, as we go and look at some of the risk issues for a lot of environmental concerns, the, the accidents, the miles driven accidents uh, issues, uh, sometimes it's not just the direct accidents of the truck, it's the way the trucks tear up the rural roads and lead to uh, other accidents, are things that are uh, major risk issues compared to some of the other risk issues that we're going to talk about, which are which are here. Uh, Obviously, the water contamination, the depletion of smaller water sources, a little less of a concern for us than it is out west, but still uh, not without uh, some concern. There's a lot of uh, air pollution issues. I'll go through them in detail. But some of them have to do with the fact that, uh, uh, that, that you've got something nearby that's emitting, but some also have to do with the issue that I'll come back to of uh, uh, we have many, many, many small sources. From a regulatory point of view, from a policy point of view, if this was all one large source, in other words, if, if someone were to cite or apply to cite a new refinery right here in Rochester or in the Finger Lakes area, there would be a major review of what this refinery was producing and there would be all sorts of uh, approaches to make sure you would minimize it because it would exceed all of the usual thresholds for policy review for regulatory actions. Now you have 
thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand, however many it's going to be, individual sites, which cumulatively may be just as bad or worse, or maybe be not as bad. I mean, we, we still don't have the numbers yet of this one big site I described. But yet, we don't have the regulatory policy approaches that would deal with this as a cumulative site rather than as an individual site. So we've got those kind of issues. Uh, for Pennsylvania, it's a particularly uh, it's a, maybe a particular issue for our ozone formation. A lot of our areas in our state are almost exceeding the ozone standard. If you do exceed the ozone standard, then the way the, 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 the state implementation plans come in, you may have to restrict your industrial development. Well, if the goal of this is to industrial development, but on the other hand, you end up with pollution which restricts your industrial development, that may be a real problem. But I'm not saying it is. I don't know yet. We're doing the studies right now. We're trying to estimate that. But over and over again, I'm going to come back to my frustration that the studies weren't done before at least we in Pennsylvania started on this way to, to develop our things. Uh, the schools, the homes, the uh, unknown hazards, uh, I'll go into those uh, a bit. Uh, the not establishing a baseline before things happen, uh, we need to do a better job. And we're starting to do that, but we need to do a better job. Uh, and all of the dynamics that occur, uh, maybe they're good, maybe they're not so good, but we need to think about them very carefully uh, rather than just brush brushing your head. We have lots of concerns. Um, I won't uh, uh, go through this. You, you, you've heard of it, but uh, Susan Christopherson, uh, this is again a, a slide that comes out of a, a conference we had last year at the University of Pittsburgh. We will have another one this year. Um, on basically what is it we know. But uh, she's done a very nice job in looking at some of the social economic uh, issues and royalty revenues over time. And why in the past do we have poor long-term outcome, not only in the United States, but around the world when we get into these development things? What can we do to cushion that to make sure we have a, uh, we do a better job of that? So I'm gonna, uh, uh, these are slides uh, that I presented to Mar our Marcella Shale Commission. Um, on the health issues. They put together a subcommittee to look at health. And um, I started off by, by saying that there's only two certainties that I, that I knew about. Then I threw a third one in there. This is, again, putting on my, my beard and my long, hair, long white hair, and not so long white hair, and basically say, oh, I've been around a long time. And here's what I'd expect. And the only certainty really is a surprise. I, I can't tell you what's going to happen. But I am absolutely certain that we're going to get surprised. We already know from studies we did at, these, at, our, at our check center that, uh, uh, and others have done, that there's a fair amount of uh, bromine coming out, uh, bromide ion in, in the effluents. Uh, why is that important? Well, uh, you may have heard about the fact that we have a trade-off that when we chlorinate drinking water, particularly if it's got some hydrocarbons in it, we will make some chlorinated hydrocarbons that themselves are carcinogenic. And we make small amounts. The risk is minuscule compared to the much greater risk of an infectious disease if we don't chlorinate the water. So we're willing to accept that. Well, as a toxicologist, I'm more worried about brominated hydrocarbons. And when you chlorinate, the way the chemistry works, you actually will, if there's bromine around, you brominate. But I know far less about them. We know we've got at least one uh, uh, area, local area, which is switched from chlorine to chloramine. And that gets into a whole other issue of the issue of chloramine versus chlorine. So as to avoid that. Um, what about radioactivity? Is that going to be an issue? Uh, the brine, there tends to be some radioactivity. There's a, lot of, a fair amount of radioactivity associated with the oil and gas, uh, certainly with the oil industry. Uh, we call it T-norm, technically enhanced, naturally occurring radioactive material. Again, I'll go into that just a little bit more, but are we going to see that? Is there something else going to happen? Yes, it will, but I don't know what it is. Okay. Uh, what happened to this? Oh, there it is. Okay. There are going to be disease clusters. I put lawsuits in there because that's the thing that, that has industry most concerned. Look, you've got lots of small communities that are going to have this activity occurring. There, the nature of statistics and the way disease just varies naturally in, 
you know, a little more now and a little less here, a little, some more here, some more there. There will be a bunch of cases of pancreatic cancer or autism or name your disease that have suddenly noticed in a community where they didn't have it before. The Marcella shell went up and the natural thing would be to do and say, hey, it's due to that. Well, what will happen then? Property values will go down. People will bat each, each other's throat all, all over the issue. Uh, uh, newspapers will have articles, uh, and people will sue. Right? I, at the University of Pittsburgh, I tell the students that the only group of our students that I know will do very well because of the Marcella Shell issue are those students who are now in law school. <laughs> um, this is what's going to happen. It's happened each time. At that point, when it does happen, the state health department will be called in and we'll try to make some sense out of this. Is, is the pancreatic cancer due to some chemical in the fracking or, uh, or coming out of the ground or whatever? Uh, at that point, it will be very difficult to do it. You have to do a retrospective exposure assessment and all of us who have been involved in the field know retrospectively it's hard to understand what people were really exposed to. So there's really a need for a prospective study. We need to start now. We don't do it in the entire area, but we need at least one well-defined area with good exposure assessment, good disease registry approaches, so that we can then turn to that area and say, well, gee, is there more pancreatic cancer? Oh my god, there is. Or, no, actually, there's no more pancreatic cancer in this way, a very well-studied group. That's probably just a statistical cluster, as we call it, a, a, a just a clustering of disease that occurs over time. Now, I can tell you that, that you can find out whether or not these clusters are real if you're willing to wait. I mean, I, I've had the experience of being in front of a high school auditorium with far more people than we have here uh, in Tom's River, New Jersey, where there was a cluster of brain cancer. And having to explain that we would know for sure. It was a statistically significant cluster. There was, there was definitely more there than you would expect given the age and the number of the kids there. Probability value, one chance of 20. Statistically significant. But there are more than 20 communities in the state of New Jersey that could have had the same thing. And there's at least one community that hasn't had a brain cancer in a kid for, you know, since 18 or except, but they're not calling the health department and say, study us. Right? I mean, that's, that's just the nature of clusters. So, how would you know? Well, you'll know it's real if prospectively more of your kids get brain cancer. Wow, that's a terrible thing to say to a group. I mean, you know, come back and, 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 and talk to us about it if, if, if another kid gets brain cancer. And, he, and that's what's going to happen. We're going to need to be able to foresee that and be able to be able to, re to, be re to respond by saying, yes, this is likely to be something that we've got to deal with, or it's, no, it's likely to be unrelated. Um, and we have to start now. There's a third certainty. And it has nothing to do with health directly, but every single one of the, of the efforts I've been involved in through the years Industry eventually has said, okay, you're forcing us to do it. We'll do it. We'll cut down on the benzene. We'll cut down on the mercury being emitted and whatnot. And when they do it, they realize they're saving money. And we've had this argument already. Dr. Ingrafi at, at Cornell has come out with a projection. I think he said 7% of the natural gas is being lost. Well, this natural gas is, is a greenhouse gas, methane. It's also an ozone precursor. It also, if it's high enough, you can actually get explosions from it. Um, industry said, no, it, no, he's got his numbers wrong. I think they said it was one point something percent. Well, even if it's just one point something percent, that's product. You should be selling that. You should not be releasing it. You can make money selling that rather than releasing it into the atmosphere where quite clearly it's going to have uh, an adverse effect. I mean, this is a greenhouse gas for sure, and there's definitely ozone that we want downwind from. Uh, so that kind of effort ought to be forced now. We ought to now be making sure that we're recycling the fracking fluid. Frac whatever the fracking fluid is, it's going to cost money. Let's not have it get out there. Okay, so what about the Gulf oil spill? I said I, I worked on that. Um, one of the things that's clear is that when you look at environmental issues, we tend to compartmentalize them. Most states, like New York, certainly 
Pennsylvania have separate organizations, have separate Department of Health, Department of Environmental Conservation. We need to be able to realize that when you deal with these issues, that the environment and human health are closely linked, that worker health is really linked. And in, particularly in issues like this, I, there are going to be worker health issues on these sites. I mean, they're construction sites. Uh, people are going to fall into ditches. I mean, that's the kind of thing that happens. If you're envisioning a small community that's now doubling in size because there's workers on these sites and somebody breaks a leg on the site, that's somebody in your community who's broken a leg. So you've got to start with thinking of the safety issues. You've got to envision the fact that these are, you know, in, in the winters here, uh, there's going to be people on the sites. And what are they going to do? They're going to try to keep warm by having some temporary building and putting in a, a paraffin heater, a kerosene heater. They're going to be carbon monoxide poisoning. Preventable, if we think about it, if we think about this in the broader sense. So those things are going to happen in their community issues. It's not that someone lives over there and works over there. These are communities we're envisioning where uh, basically they're growing because they're part of it. Uh, we need to figure out how to approach this so that we can balance the, the, the needs of a community to understand what's happening with the, with the uh, needs of the industry to move forward. Uh, how many of you have heard about the dispersant used in the Gulf in a million gallons? Yeah, so most people have heard it. This was an unprecedented amount of dispersant that was used to work with the Gulf oil. Uh, the material safety data sheet on this uh, dispersant basically described one of the components, the organic sulfonic acid salt, is proprietary. They wouldn't say what it was. Anybody know what it turned out to be? Well, yeah, the folks at the Gulf don't, don't know, aren't able to answer this either. Actually, EPA finally put it on its website, even though it was against the law to do so. They said what it is. And uh, I want to ask for a show of hands, but if any of you have ever taken uh, a common, everyday, over-the-counter stool softener, you've taken this compound. Okay. Now, now think about this. As a toxicologist, I have absolutely no concern about the dose that you might have gotten because of the use of it as a dispersant. Because I know in much higher doses, literally millions of doses a day, are being used around the world, okay, or in the United States. Now, I don't know what it's doing to the, to the, to the, the, the ocean, to the dead zone in the, the Gulf. I don't know, maybe it's causing all sorts of changes in fish or uh, causing more, ass, or more uh, uh, a formation of toxins in, in the sea that get into our fish. I, I, I can't comment on that, but I'm not worried about the direct effects. But I will tell you, in the Gulf, people are were worried to start with. It was a tremendous dislocating psychosocial impact on their community, added to which was this fact that they didn't know what the hell this, 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 this thing was. And why should companies keep it secret? Any other company can in what? Uh, how long would it take to do a mass spec, a GC on this? Uh, uh, five minutes and they can figure out what it was? And also, if you look at the ranges of this, one to five percent, 10 to 30 percent, that's, that's not right. We should know what these compounds are that people are using in this process. We should know what the fracking compounds are. Keeping these secret is simply, you're not fooling your, your industry competitors, and all you're doing is basically keeping the public in, in, uh, uninformed and frightened. We're much more frightened of things we don't know than things we do know, and this is, this is an example. 